The worst women on earth. Evil can find you where you least expect it. On the road, in your home, and even, perhaps, in the face of the person you married. For many, that discovery comes as a serious shock. But for the family and wary associates of Lizzie Halliday, it shouldn't have been all that surprising. After all, as a scathing 1918 obituary in the New York Times put it, she was no less than the worst woman on earth. In the 1890s this was the nickname given to Lizzie Halliday, New York's first known female serial killer. She was also the first woman to ever be sentenced to death by the electric chair. Welcome to Spider Stories. We bring you true stories every other day that are guaranteed to send chills down your spine. From stories of restless spirits to encounters with otherworldly beings, you will be captivated by these pulse-pounding narratives. So buckle up because these stories will keep you on the edge of your seat. Lizzie Halliday was born in Ireland in 1864, she first made it to American shores when she was 8 years old. While the details of Lizzie's time in Ireland and her first few years in America get muddled, most accounts agree that, once she started marrying, her husbands fared poorly. Her first known husband was Charles Hopkins, just two years after their 1879 marriage, which produced a son, Hopkins died. Artemis Brewer, a veteran who was to be husband number two, lasted less than a year after marrying Lizzie. The Lizzie was never formally accused of foul play when it came to Hopkins and Brown, however her later activities certainly made reporters wonder if there was something more to the two men's deaths. If she really did get rid of them in some way, then perhaps her third husband was the luckiest of all. Hiram Parkinson, the husband in question, simply abandoned her after a year of marriage. After Lizzie's third husband left her, she then reportedly took up with an associate of her second husband. That man, George Smith, was also a veteran. Though it's unclear what happened between the two, accounts state that she attempted to poison him, the delivery method was a cup of tea laced with arsenic. Though donning the tea surely would have been an unpleasant experience, Smith somehow survived. Even more fortunately for him, Lizzie does not seem to have been a completist. While he was recovering, she did not plot another attempt, but instead ran off to Vermont, where she bigamously married Charles Plaistel, having never divorced or otherwise divested herself of Smith. No matter, though in two weeks, Lizzie was already gone, disappearing for a time into the Northeast. What she did between her dalliance with Plaistel and her next appearance remains unknown. Eventually, Lizzie reappeared in Philadelphia, where she arranged to stay with the McQuillan family, whom her own family had known back in Ireland. While she was settling in, the entrepreneurial spirit apparently took hold of her, as she opened up a small shop. However, she soon burned down the shop in an attempt to collect on an insurance policy. Though it proved a major misstep. Lizzie was caught, convicted of arson, and sentenced to a term in the Eastern State Penitentiary. From where she was released after two years, emerging in 1889 with, as subsequent events would show, very little penitence on her mind. This time, she left Pennsylvania for upstate New York, where she would soon come across an unfortunate man named Paul. At first, Paul Halliday may have thought that things were going pretty decently. He got along well with his new housekeeper. In fact, they were so in tune with each other that they married. Paul was almost 70, had a disabled son, and was pulling in a military pension along with a considerable income from his farmlands. It could well have been that the seemingly frugal man decided that it would be cheaper to marry the 30-something-year-old woman instead of paying her. But things went south soon after the wedding when Lizzie stole a team of horses and, with an unnamed companion, fled the area, but she got caught soon afterwards. Her husband managed to get her released, but it would prove to be a poor decision. Not long after Paul Halliday took his wife home from the asylum, things went from bad to much, much worse. Sources at the time suspected Lizzie of setting fire to the Halliday family barn and a mill building, too. What's more, Paul's disabled son, John, was in the house at the time of the fire, which he did not survive. Instead of complaining to gawkers and reporters, it may have been more in Paul's interest if he had left Lizzie or recommitted her to an asylum. It certainly would have looked reasonable enough, with Lizzie's increasing rap sheet and odd behavior, not to mention the murdered son. 
But, if he had considered such a course of action, it was too late for Paul Halliday. A short while after the burning of three of his buildings, he disappeared. Paul Halliday's other children were already plenty suspicious of their father's much younger wife. So, by the time Mr. Halliday went missing, they were already primed to direct their narrowed gazes towards the unstable woman who had already caused so much trouble for their family. Lizzie Halliday's story that her husband had gone out of town, for some unspecified business reason, therefore fell on skeptical ears and they decided to search the Halliday property. As people began to comb through the home, barn, and surrounding property, they would make a gruesome discovery. Yet, it wasn't Paul they found, or at least not initially. Instead, as they picked through a pile of hay in the barn on September 4, 1893, they came across the bodies of two women though Lizzie's husband, for the time being, remained missing. The story is that on August 30, 1893, Lizzie, perhaps already having killed her husband, Lizzie took a horse-drawn wagon and drove to the McQuillan farm. There, she presented herself as the proprietor of a boarding house who needed to hire a cleaner. Mother Margaret McQuillan unknowingly jumped at the opportunity and returned to the Halliday farm. Once asleep, Lizzie reportedly drugged and then shot the woman. She then returned to the McQuillans, now saying that Margaret had suffered an accident. 19-year-old Sarah Jane traveled back with Lizzie, believing she would be helping her incapacitated mother. She, too, was apparently shot to death while asleep. Both mother and daughter's bodies were then dragged to the barn and concealed beneath hay. Not long after the remains of the McQuillans were recovered, the mystery of the missing Paul Halliday was also solved, but in a rather gruesome fashion. His corpse was found on September 6, stashed beneath the floorboards of his own kitchen. Lizzie had apparently shot him while he slept, then bludgeoned his head with an axe. From there, it was a seemingly simple affair of removing the floorboards, digging a shallow grave, rolling her husband's body off the couch and into the hole, then covering up what she had done. With three bodies now found on the Halliday property, it was obvious to the authorities that Lizzie needed to be taken in, she was arrested shortly after Paul's body was discovered. While in custody, Lizzie appeared to be incoherent and self-destructive, even going so far as to harm herself with broken glass. She also attempted to hang herself, burn her own bed, and tried to strangle the sheriff's wife. Some wondered if she was exaggerating her behavior to avoid execution, though, if past reports of her behavior are indeed reliable, she may have been genuinely delusional. While awaiting trial, Lizzie Halliday quickly became a notorious figure. Word of her crime reached reporters who, apparently looking for shocking true crime stories with as much fervor as any modern podcaster, latched onto the gruesome details. The New York world even went so far as to claim that her case was without parallel in the annals of crime. Resultantly Halliday was convicted of the murder and sentenced to death. The sentence was later commuted to lifetime institutionalization on the grounds that she was mentally unfit. She was to spend the remainder of her days at the Matawan Hospital for the criminally insane. Locking Lizzie Halliday in an asylum for the rest of her life sounds like the ending of a horror movie. Yet. She wasn't done just yet. Though her misdeeds didn't really happen until people had let their guard down. At first, Lizzie largely seemed to behave herself and gained a reputation as a tractable inmate. Yet, she occasionally reminded those around her that she was capable of violence. During her time at Matawan, Lizzie grew close to one attendant in particular, a young woman named Nellie Wicks. According to multiple newspaper articles, the pair got along fairly well, but things soured in 1906 when Wicks told Halliday that she was leaving to train as a nurse. Halliday cornered the trusting attendant in a locked room, whereupon she grabbed a pair of scissors that hung from Wicks' belt and stabbed the younger woman to death. Though the case of the worst women on earth to this day has many unanswered questions. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to stay tuned for more true stories.